if you're an insider right now. Um, when I first moved to Albuquerque in the late 1970s, uh, it was like coming to another country. I'm sure something that a lot of people from someplace else could. The internet is down. I don't know if that has um, New Mexico was that different was. from my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. it, it took a while, but I began to immerse myself in the culture from low riders to Pueblos to green chili. Um, in particular, my wife and I were fascinated by Northern New Mexico and often visited towns and villages like Chimayo and Truchas and Arroyo Hondo. Maybe I was paranoid, but it seemed that whenever we visited these mostly Hispanic enclaves, we were suspect. There was no hostility or anything, just a sense that the residents were wary of outsiders like us. Um, another thing that I noticed after uh, I'd gone to work for the Albuquerque Journal a couple was that at public meetings, <clears throat> Hispanic speakers frequently began their comments by proudly noting what generation they were, not baby boomer or Gen X, but things like I'm Leroy Gutierrez and I'm 15th generation New Mexican, or I'm Isabel Montoya and I'm 16th century New Mexican. I didn't understand how that had anything to do with the matter at hand, a zoning variance or a water issue, but as I learned, it did. Um, New Mexico boasts a, a complex and wonderful culture, and I discovered over the years that pride and family heritage and ties to the land were really foundational parts of that culture. That was true to some extent for every ethnic group. For, for Hispanics, though, it was often tied directly to the existence of lands granted to the early Spanish settlers by the King of Spain. The wariness of old residents in northern New Mexico, I believe in part, was due to the fraught history of these Spanish land grants. Despite the promises of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, they or their ancestors had experienced the loss of these communal lands, often illegally, and usually as a result of interlopers from somewhere else or the federal government. In the 1960s, a fiery preacher from Texas, Reyes Lopez Tierina, revived the fight for those lands. So by the time I arrived here, it was still fresh in everyone's minds. When I started working um, on this film about the Trisco land grant, um, just prior to the pandemic, that all came back to me. At the, at the time, I possessed a cursory knowledge of the Trisco. I knew it was one of the oldest and largest land grants in New Mexico and had somehow survived mostly intact into the 20th century. I knew the original footprint included most of Albuquerque west of the Rio Grande. I knew there had been a nasty fight over the sale of the remaining land in 2006 to outsiders from California. But I also knew by this time that there was much more to the story. At that time, a lot was made about the selling price of the remaining lands, 250 million. And for some heirs, the sale had been a windfall. For others, the centuries-old connection to the land had been severed, and no amount of money would compensate for that loss. This film, One with the Land, um, explores that connection between <coughs> heritage and land, and the continuing impact of Etrusco on the city and the former heirs. Um, I'd just like to say, like, like many of the pieces I've been fortunate to do over the years, uh, this documentary gave me a better, much better appreciation of the state we live in today. And I hope it'll do the same for you. So again, thanks for coming out and I will uh, stick around to answer questions afterwards. Thanks. The history of New Mexico is etched in its land, reflected in its waters, and symbolized in its traditions. Nowhere is that history embodied more fully than in Las Mercedes, or land grants, 
and none loom larger than Atrisco, the first Merced officially recognized in New Mexico after the Reconquista of 1692. Back then, Atrisco was a remote outpost on the frontier of New Spain, a stop on the Camino Real and home to a smattering of mostly Spanish settlers. Today, more than 300 years later, the giant footprint of the grant absorbs the inexorable growth of New Mexico's largest city westward from the Rio Grande. But to understand the past, present, and future of Atrisco, one must grasp the concept of querencia, the place where you are your most authentic self, the place you draw your strength from, the place you feel truly at home. I would define it as, as a long-standing relationship to place. It's uh, basically your connection to your land, your connection to your community, your obligations to your community. A human can be um, sort of melded with the landscape, almost like water. And we get that love of the land uh, from the, uh, I think, the agricultural heritage, uh, people knowing that they're in tune uh, with nature. You know when the rainy season is, you know kind of when it's time to start cooling the crops, things like that. If it's also taking care of that place, that you have a responsibility to, you know, to the community, you have responsibility to the landscape, you have responsibility to the environment. And it's also ties to one another, um, mutual aid societies, um, groups, connections, things like that. What I learned most um, from, from speaking with, with folks in the land grants is just how much that the human connection to that landscape mattered to them and that they were willing to fight for it. We are the land ourselves. We are that water. It really is an experience. Um, it's a connection that's felt within the core of one's being. The name Atrisco is a nod to some of the earliest visitors to the area, Tlaxcalteca Indians and other Indios Mexicanos, invited by Juan de Oñate in 1598 to travel north and help settle the new territory. Uh, the original place name is Atlisco, which is a Nahuatl term, a Mexican Indian term, which means place on the water. The water is the Rio Grande River. Spanish colonists considered the vast area between the pueblos of Sandia and Isleta, west of the Rio Grande, prime land for farming and grazing, and established homesteads there by the 1660s. The settlers were driven out in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. But soon after Diego de Vargas returned in 1692 to reconquer the territory, he granted 40,000 acres in Atrisco to Fernando Durán y Chávez and a group of Spanish-Mexican settlers on the condition they proved they could survive on the land. They were put in possession directly by de Vargas. He says, this, this group of 22-odd families, this is your grant. That system was made really to populate northern New Spain and what was a Mexican territory's claim to this part of North America. They were specifically to help sustain that community, to make sure that there was a, a, a place to live, a small plot of land, uh, what they call the ejidos, which were the common land, were the grazing lands, the hunting lands, uh, the, the fuel wood gathering lands in which a community shared in those resources in which to maintain themselves collectively. In 1703, the provincial government officially recognized the community of Atrisco, three years prior to the founding of the Villa de Albuquerque. In 1768, the settlers acquired an additional 26,000 acres, extending the land grant west to the Rio Puerco. The importance of, uh, of, of becoming, uh, a you know, be becoming part of a land grant is that you were able to work a piece of land. You, didn't, you, you were able to work yourself out of servitude. It was a way to move yourself out of poverty. There were organizations around acequias, around uh, religious institutions that were more than that. They were social support systems. My grandpa who raised me would take us out to the west side, you know, west of Unser, where we would go hunt rabbits and hunt dove and quail. And he would always tell me, you know what, mijito, this land belongs to all of us. This land was our ancestors. Um, this is something that no one can ever take away. 
you know this is this is our patrimony this is something that's been passed down between the generations and it's something that we have to take care of and that we will always have your land art becomes the basis of your identity. So more so than being important as a Spanish citizen or a citizen of Mexico or now in the idea of being um, even New Mexican or American, more importantly is that I am a land grant member. I belong to a group of people, a community that exists on its own through a collective economy, a coll collective history of relationships and a land base that ties us together. The early settlers suffered many hardships, mainly climate, raids from warring tribes like the Apaches, Comanches, and Navajos, and encroachment from outsiders. But through both Spanish and Mexican governance, Atrisqueños kept their merced intact. The end of the Mexican-American War in 1848 brought more challenges. Although the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was supposed to protect land grants in New Mexico territory, much property was lost through legal and illegal means over the next several decades. There was a lot of ways that land speculators, attorneys, um, could kind of game the system. In 1891, a federal court of private land claims was formed to sort out disputes. But even this process failed to protect the majority of New Mexico land grants. By the 1960s, it's something more like 98% of all land claims are lost. But presented with a petition from 225 incorporators and records to back up their claims, the court reaffirmed the Atrisco grant in 1894. The Court of Private Land Claims was, was part of the process of having heirs come forward through a judicial review to prove their ownership in the land grant as a whole. So heirs had to come forward at that time and stake their claim, essentially. And many heirs did, and unfortunately, some heirs did not. That problem would, would, would haunt us in the years forward. Nevertheless, in 1905, President Teddy Roosevelt signed a U.S. patent conveying more than 82,000 acres, the amount determined by an official land survey, to the town of Atrisco. The 20th century presented a new set of problems for the Atrisco grant owners. The agricultural and grazing economy, which had sustained many of the heirs, began to decline and they sought other ways to benefit from the common lands. Some development did occur, including the sale of land for small airports and what became the Westgate Heights housing subdivision. And in later years, a portion of the land was sold to be preserved in the Petroglyph National Monument but few heirs benefited from the land sales. Atrisco was kind of relegated to be the little brother of Albuquerque to some degree. And some of the kind of political energy and political power that was wielded from in Atrisco, it just kind of dissipated. And, and you could see how, you know, definitely 50s and 60s, Albuquerque basically then just kind of swallows Atrisco whole and overtakes it. In 1967, in the midst of the movement to reclaim land grants in northern New Mexico, led by charismatic preacher Reyes Lopez Tijerina, the New Mexico legislature approved a bill to allow land grants to be reorganized as for-profit corporations. A faction of the board moved to incorporate the Atrisco land grant as Westland Development, a shareholding company. I don't know if there were a clash of philosophies, there were just differences of approaches maybe. Tijerina was like, uh, you know, a shooting star. And basically opened the eyes of community land grant heirs, uh, particularly with regard to the international implications of this question and how it uh, is related to the, question, to the issue of the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Some of the people at the forefront of that movement were atrisqueños. Um, Tijerina's right-hand man, his bodyguard, was someone from Atrisco. 1967, there's the infamous courthouse raid in Tierra Maria. So this is, you know, the their most successful, most visible activism, you know, in, in the mid to late 60s. And amidst that, the Westland Corporation, uh, you know, comes into being. So you had a combination of people that felt like um, activism, 
and protest and was the was one of the strategies to kind of be recognized to understand that we do have a tie to this land and we want our rights to the land on the other side you do have people that had you know a formal education that had ties to politicians that had ties and strong understanding of law and land use law and and development practices and they felt like that was the strategy to go towards and there were many of that generation who advocated people to move on, move on from those traditional economies. You know, Joseph Montoya, the senator at the time, you know, was telling people, look, those are the bygone days. You had to either say you were an heir or not, and if you didn't say you were an heir, you actually lost all your rights to the, the grant. So unfortunately, my grandpa, mistrusting and not really knowing or having any kind of resource to really get the correct information, decided not to declare because of he didn't trust what it meant. And that happened to many, many folks. The proposition came to a vote in 1967, and those who did claim to be herederos voted 583 to 528 to approve the creation of Westland. For many, this was the first step on the path of losing the history, heritage, and culture of Atrisco. The move to incorporate sparked decades of acrimony as shareholders accused the Westland Board of abuses, heirs and board members feuded among themselves, and the promises of lucrative development failed to materialize. Unfortunately, one of the downsides of turning the Atrisco land grant into Westland Development Corporation is that it really depersonalized the entire land grant purpose. Prior to this, the belief that was that the land grant was a community asset for the benefit of the community members. When we shifted into more of a corporate status where you were holding a share of stock, it became very impersonal for the heirs. There was a bad move that was made because the land base was, uh, was obliterated. So people are saying, well, we converted this for survival. We thought it would provide some form of economic means for the families, but no one's really benefiting aside from the people that are on the board and, and their relatives and their connections. When you mentioned the word Westland Corporation, that was just synonymous with corruption. I mean, it was to that point that people just really felt it because you know, there was evidence that money was coming in. There was no money going out. People weren't getting a benefit. It's not like shareholders were getting their checks and nothing was happening. If we're all being honest, they were not very productive. So while they were supposed to be a development corporation, they really did very few projects that had development outcomes. Even after a reform slate of board candidates assumed control in 1989, many shareholders continued to complain of insider trading and urge changes in the board's direction. Atrisco para los atrisqueños. But it was a lie. It was not atrisco for the atrisqueños. It was how are we going to figure out a way to sell this thing uh, to give the upper echelon shareholders a profit. That's why you had a huge movement against them to try to take our land back and take back control of, of our, not just our land, but kind of our destiny to some degree. But as the 20th century came to an end, two factors came into play. The pressures um, were mounting for Westland and the Atrisco land grab because the city of Albuquerque had been growing east, north, and south and had pretty much maxed out its opportunities in those directions. And the only open space left for the city to grow was west, the Atrisco land grant. That pressure was compounded by an artificially induced nationwide real estate boom driven by subprime mortgages issued to unqualified buyers. It caused real estate prices to rise. And as real estate prices began to rise, interest in the Atrisco land grant and all that open space for property development began to rise as well. They began to become um, a target um, for buyers, real estate development companies, national organizations, out of state entities interested in buying the, 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 the west side of Albuquerque. The fate of the grant would be determined in 2006 
when the Westland Board called for a vote to sell the remaining 50,000 plus acres of common lands to a California corporation, SunCal. Reformers, such as the Concerned Heirs of Atrisco, contested the sale. Concerned Heirs of Atrisco really evolved before the sale was announced. I would say the sale was a reaction against this group organizing to retake the corporation. There was no announcement of a sale until well after we were organizing and kind of agitating to change direction. And then once that happened, all of our energy then shifted towards, we got to stop this sale. There was a lot of contentious behavior going on uh, during that time frame. A lot of unhappy people, a lot of differing opinions. But ultimately, following corporate law, Westland took a vote of the shareholders and over 70% of these shareholders, heirs, chose to sell. Westland reaped $250 million from the sale. For the nearly 6,000 registered heirs, it meant an average payout of $37,000, according to Forbes magazine. The nine board members split $15 million. By the time of the sale, when Westland turns to Sinecal and that last sale does happen, you know, people were more than willing to sell. They don't remember sheep grazing, they don't remember cattle, they don't remember actually living off the land because their grandfather's father did that. They haven't done that for generations at this point. And so for them, you know, selling just made sense. You know, especially people who probably don't have a lot of money to start with. So, wait, I can sign off on something that I don't even use and you're gonna give me $20,000 for it? Sign me up, give me that check. You know, I'm gonna go buy a pickup. Meanwhile, others mourned the sale. You know, when Westland was created and then when Westland sold out the whole thing, um, uh, my observation was the whole thing was, it was a traumatic event. It causes what I call spirit injury. It, it disrupted, it dismembered the body. Basically, in my lifetime, I've gone from us looking up there to the West Mesa and pointing and saying, you know, those are our traditional lands to uh, becoming a landless peasant. You have a family that's built up over three centuries that had a huge family fight. And so for those that didn't think that that land should be sold, it's like grandpa's house was sold and you can't go visit grandpa's house anymore. While all that's left of the original Atrisco Merced are three cemeteries and an historic chapel, heirs remain concerned about land use and economic development and public officials grappled daily with the challenge of maintaining the rural character of the South Valley while planning for suburban growth on the west side. We are looking for economic justice, and that means we want as many jobs as there is on the other side of the river. Through poor planning and, you know, the lack of infrastructure, um, you know, um, residents of the southwest area have, have really feel you know, they've been neglected throughout the years and feel that they've contributed to taxes and to the growth of the city through its workforce and, and really um, developing the city as a, as a whole and not really gotten their fair share in return. We want to be able to live on that side of the river and work on that side of the river and shop on that side of the river and go to the bank on that side of the river and go to the dry cleaner on that side. You know, very simple things that I'm asking for as a county commissioner and as a resident of the Southwest Mesa, um, everybody else has in the city of Albuquerque. We do not have that. Yet, the biggest controversy on Atrisco land centers on a proposed 13,700-acre mixed-use development known as Santolina, an initiative of Western Albuquerque Land Holdings, the company Barclays Bank of London formed with investors after foreclosing on the Suncow property. As a county commissioner, I definitely want to make sure that that, is, that dream stays alive, that we protect agricultural land from development. But without us developing in the South Valley, where do we go? So we go to Mesa del Sol and we go to Santolina, we go to the Southwest Mesa. There's concern over Santolina and the growth, and I think it's on many fronts. I mean, I think it's on, it's on the water, it's on sprawl, it's on whether we want to grow in an urban type setting. And we've, we've never had the planning. Now I think it's, it's our opportunity um, to plan. 
Supporters of the approved master plan note that Santalina, unlike previous West Side subdivisions, is required to provide job opportunities before it can fully build out housing. But concerns remain. I think the idea of Santalina is still driven off an old sprawl uh, concept of development, still off that post-World War II development, and Albuquerque hasn't really caught up to the sort of development that is in the market. The reality is, is what we need to do is find ways of maintaining affordability in some of these older areas. We need to upgrade infrastructure in some of these areas they, so they can handle greater capacity. And we need to get serious about connecting via public transit. I don't see anywhere in that how creating a new city, you know, miles out on the Seja is going to actually solve any of those issues. But short of purchasing the land, the city and county can only exert so much control over development of the property. You have organizations that accuse me of, of, of supporting, you know, uh, large corporations, big business, big bankers, you know. Well, they own the land and, um, uh, and they're going to develop that land. Some of the heirs of the Atrisco land grant want to be able to get their land back. Nothing would make me happier but look, at the end of the day, even if it was, the original owners of, and the original families from the Trisco land grant who own that land, I am not going to allow them to develop it without a master plan. If the county commission would not have approved that development plan, um, it would have left it up to chance in terms of uh, the owners being able to parcel it off much like Pajarito Mesa, which is something that we really absolutely can't afford. It's worse than a third world country uh, right here in the United States of America. They have no water, they have no electricity, and that's one thing that we want to make sure never happens ever again. As heirs face a landless existence for the first time in 300 years, they pursue many paths in their attempts to preserve the heritage of Atrisco. In 2012, heirs convinced the state legislature to recognize the town of Atrisco Grant Merced as a political subdivision. Uh, even though we don't have our land base intact, uh, we have to get our land back one way or the other. The future, I think, is still bright. The land is not going away. It continues to be there, and, and, and so that's ongoing. I think for the town of Atrisco land grant and for that board, you know, there, there is a distinct possibility of getting the land back. Uh, you know, whether they're going to get the whole 80,000 acres, that's a much more tall task, right? But like many land grants, you know, the town of Tomé has done it piece by piece. You know, you're very strategic. You're almost surgical in your approach to what land you're going to get back. To commemorate Atrisco, the community envisioned a West Side Visitor Center and Museum. Councilor Peña and Commissioner Quesada have partnered with local, state, and federal officials to make that happen. They also hope to gain an open space designation for a plot of land that overlooks one of Atrisco's original settlements. Both work closely with groups like the West Central Community Development Group and Southwest Alliance of Neighbors to bring needed improvements to the Southwest area. As part of the SunCal sale, the company agreed to underwrite a foundation to carry on the history and legacy of Atrisco at a cost of $1 million a year for 100 years. The Atrisco Companies was formed to carry on that legacy and it set up the foundation. But after only three annual payments, SunCal went bankrupt in 2009 after the real estate bubble burst and Barclays Bank foreclosed on the land. But Atrisco Companies, using the $3 million in seed money, formed several new companies. Now, our main purpose with that money was to immediately try to provide our heirs with benefits that they felt were never offered or provided by Westland. So we set up a number of programs early on to utilize the money to provide scholarships and various programs for our kids uh, to get educations through summer camps and summer, summer programs and scholarships so that we could give back to our community. Sanchez believes the Atrisco companies have fulfilled the land grant's intent by becoming a social enterprise, focusing on education, cultural preservation, and economic development. The community and the Atrisco heirs benefit from the Atrisco companies today in lots of ways. They gave uh, scholarships in partnership with the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. 
So they gave about 40 scholarships a year to heirs that were at CNM, UNM, at schools across the country. I received the scholarship three times. The companies really watched out for me. I think it's because I really took an interest in it and I really do credit you know, being in the Congresswoman's office now to them and their mentorship. Like many proud Atrisco heirs, Sofia believes heeding the wisdom of elders and maintaining customs and traditions is crucial. My grandfather was very important to me. And I think um, we had a special relationship. He instilled, you know, just identity that helped me be confident in life, that maybe I wouldn't have been if it wasn't for him, that I could, you know, I, I kind of went through life thinking I could accomplish whatever because of what he told me and the importance of, of our people and our land and our history. So it's not about an acre, five acres, a thousand acres, 2,000 acres, 90,000 acres. It's not about that. It's about what, what does it mean to be, to perpetuate your idea of your people? I think what our elders in our community need to understand is that they need to teach us about the history of the land grant. Uh, that's what will get lost if we don't know it. Um, it's, it's admirable and it's a great fight to try to get physical land back. But if we don't have the land in our hearts and minds and in that history to carry on to our children, then it will truly be lost. I have um, great hope in the young people who um, now have that connection in their hands. And so um, their next steps will be important. I think that in keeping the knowledge alive um, within themselves and within the future generations ensures that um, the land grants themselves will live. And all of those connections and all of those concerns also um, ensure that the landscape will somehow survive. We have spaces where our grandparents grew up that have been forgotten. And they're sitting there in disrepair. And it's not that nobody cares. I just think a lot of people specifically from the community kind of feel helpless and they don't understand how to reinvigorate life in those spaces. And I think for me personally, <clears throat> my mission is really to find a way to do that. Um, whether it's through actually developing, doing rehab of these spaces, um, finding ways and partnerships to create cultural based programming. So we remember kind of the old stories. We remember who we are. We start connecting to some of the old ceremonies that we once conducted. To me, I feel like that is the most effective way forward, is really leading by our hearts, understanding who we are as a people, reconnecting to our history, and starting to tell some of those old stories again. Colorín Colorado, este cuento no se acaba. The story is not over yet. It's, uh, I think, more of a mythological entity at this point. It's, it's, uh, there's no, there's no specific place that uh, I'm aware of or that anybody told me about. There's the just... heart, the heart of the truth. In, in the heart of Matrisco right now is, um, just south of Central on a Trisco Boulevard, uh, and adjacent, which is. Um, and you can really 
get a feel for, for what a true pro was wow. and what it is mm -hmm. right now. Holy Family Churches is an iconic marker mm -hmm. for a Cristo. That's where my family grew up. Uh, our family grew up across the street from Holy Family Church. And, and I think the history and the uh, just the spirit of truth still lives on in that little area. But is that where that mural is? Pardon me? Is that where that mural is? Holy um, Family Church? No, it's no. not a national. Oh, Tony? Oh, that's a... Yes. No, not the Tori on the mural. That oh, that's no, the mural. The Facebook audience, would you mind moving back to the podium? They, they can't see or hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I know the I can't well, for sites. Um, question back here. Um, just, um, I, I just wanted to, uh, one person I wanted to especially thank, some of you may know Enrique de la Madrid over at UNM. He was um, absolutely instrumental in helping me um, put this together. He got me in contact with a lot of these folks. He even found the music. We we uh, got music from the Center for Southwest Research from the Rob Collection. He, and he cur actually curated that for us. It was a huge help. And um, I can't remember why he didn't want to uh, be interviewed for the film. <laughs> but he did, all, he did all the other uh, background stuff. And you may have noticed at the end that uh, the piece itself was funded um, by the Albuquerque City Council, Clarissa Pena specifically, and asked for um, funding for that and was produced under the um, auspices of the Cultural Services Department of the City of Albuquerque. When? 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 Yeah, when was it? I finished it in um, right before the pandemic hit. So about, well, before it hit, or probably late, late. Uh, 2019, early 2020. Oh, so, so, yeah. as you know, there's a couple of things that are out of date. Obviously, Deb Holland is yeah. in another position <laughs> now, but but other than that, it, and I, and Santalina is still a, still an issue to this yeah. day. Yeah. So that was uh, I bet that one. Uh, so, any other questions or anything about that? Yeah. Were there any uh, legal repercussions from uh, some of the heirs towards the uh, the board's uh, acquisition of the money that they got. Oh well, I uh, I I don't know. I didn't I didn't look much after the sale, but between I don't know 1980 and and uh, the early 2000s, there were lawsuits just filed left and right. Everybody was going after everybody. And the board again was a, was a particular target. I didn't get into it uh, mainly because I don't want to get sued. But there, was, <laughs> there were a lot of stories off the record about manipulations by board members themselves, um, how they uh, manipulated uh, landowners into selling their shares to them cheap, and then I mean, of course, as I said in there, the the average payout was thirty seven thousand dollars to the heirs, but every every one of the board members left. Um, yeah. after that and so um some of the people we interviewed i mean i know <laughs> a lot of these people weren't very happy about that and that was one reason they were fighting it because there was some stuff that was going on ultimately the board yeah. Yeah. i don't have their names handy you can look that up um and I would also, if you're interested in the subject, I would recommend a book called Between Two Rivers by Joseph Sanchez, who's a uh, professor over at UNM, and um, he's a great authority on this. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, following up on that reference to being a town, uh, usually uh, in the state governance, if you're, whether you're a town, village, or a city, it's, it, it's up to the incorporating area, pick one of them. There's, but they do have legal requirements. So it sounds like this is not really legal. It's more of an honorary type in a way. Like, a, was it passed as a memorial in this legislature? <laughs> Some, something, yeah, something in because between there because they, they don't have, have, have some kind of governance. Um, they don't have the right to tax people, for instance, right. to live in the grand grant. So at this at this point, it's it's. Uh, I don't know, Barb, you can tell me more probably, but it's probably more of an honorary. Like my previous county, the CIA 
say it's a, the neighborhood incorporated yes. by Albuquerque. And, um, and it's complicated, but if you look at the city boundaries in the South Valley, correct. they're higgledy piggledy. They yeah. don't, especially near Central. And then you have that line that shoots down the Coors uh -huh. with a big chunk down there. Right, right, right. The North Valley is even worse than some of but that's a <laughs> yeah. whole other story. Right, and yeah. so that's just exactly how it is. Yeah. Like, it's, I, I think that's they never rational. really rationalized that one way or the other. Mm -hmm. so it, for instance, there were several votes on incorporating the city as the county, and it was, I think, defeated two or three times. Yeah, three times. Yeah. But uh, so, in a sense, most of the Trisco is not really even in Albuquerque, it's in the Albuquerque metro. Right, that's it's county. basically in the county. County property or county political boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> I want to reminisce that in 2003, Holy Family uh, Church, their senior group went to Home Depot and got these um, pipes and stuff and put together a, an exhibit about the history that was in the parish hall for a couple of weeks. And I heard about it. I was at the Old Main Library and said, hey, you want to put that over here? And so we get, we, we had that uh, history exhibit. And uh, that was, uh, and when I saw Diane Schaller up there as well. Uh, we had programs and, and at the Special Collections Library. And, and uh, thanks partly to Ramon Herrera, who was one of the um, uh, the guys on the board who, who I, I kept seeing his name through all of those newspapers. Uh, who, uh, but he uh, he sure was an advocate <coughs> for keeping the history alive of that of, of the grant. And, Do you know what's happened to that? Uh, any of that? Is it, is it, it, it was the property of the uh, Holy Family yeah. uh, Parish, and they. There were paintings, there were uh, toys, there were um, a remarkable array of things that uh, uh, Joel Tito Ramirez's uh, uh, symbol was, was in that um, in their uh, plaque there. You can see a lot of that still at the multi-generational center there in the Trisco area. Mesa area of the metropolitan area. On September 30th, there was a ribbon cutting uh, for the new uh, U.S. Uh, Route 66 Visitor Center and, and Route 66 Museums. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there. It was like a two-hour set of uh, speeches with Clarissa Pena and Stephen Michael Gazzada and Mayor Keller and people from the governor's office on down and every every neighborhood representative and a lot of neighborhood activists were there to celebrate this newest uh, community center uh, for a lot of them. They're saying this is going to be the new place for all of us in the mm -hmm. Southwest 
Father Metropolitan area can come to have education to celebrate ourselves and so forth and so on. And and uh, Luis Hernandez Jr. is the executive director of what you saw on the screen of that West Central Development Corporation. They are a nonprofit private group that's been hired by Millinger County to run this new visitor center. And so it's going to take several months to get things filled up and going, but that'll be a, a new thing for people that live in the, in the lands of the Triscoll Land Grant that you go to, as well as something for old men's metropolitan area to go visit. And their, their Route 66 Museum is something we at the Albuquerque Historical Center are, are, are equally interested in. And we and I told me first on September 30th that their forthcoming curator there will be in touch with us in coming months to see what we at the Albuquerque Historical Center can do to help contribute to this museum. And I'm hoping to get somebody there to speak about this museum and future advice. Tell me where that is again. What? Where is that again? It's out on near Nine Mile Hill, all the way up, very oh, it's much, uh, close to where I 40 and Central Avenue uh, oh, cool. come together. And it's about a half mile east of there. It's like <coughs> 13,000 something southwest central. It's not open yet, is it? It is, well. It's officially completed. They don't have any, uh, they don't have it, the inside filled up yet. So they, it's not officially open yet, but yeah. it'll be sometime soon. Yeah. 2023 is what. Uh, That's only a few months away. We'll be able to get in it, I think. Yeah, that's probably correct. All right. Let's give a final round of applause for yeah. uh, Next month, um, November 20th. We're dismissed. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>